Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you have joined from. My name is Patty, and I will be your host today. First, thank you all for registering and taking the time to join us today for this webinar on image analysis deep dive into the world of pixels. But before I begin, I have a few housekeeping announcements. At any time during the webinar, please feel free to ask questions by typing them into the questions or chat window on your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of the session. Following the webinar, the recording will be available and shared with all attendees. If you experience any technical issues, please visit the help menu in the GoToWebinar control panel on the right of your screen. And lastly, I've placed all of you on mute to prevent any background noise. Now to provide a quick background on AppsTech, we provide customized IT consulting services for companies ranging from midsize to Fortune 100 enterprises across a wide range of industry verticals. Leveraging agile practices, AppsTech SHMEs subject matter experts, architects and associates build software applications, platforms, and products that become primary drivers of innovation and revenue growth for our clients and their businesses. AppsTech is recognized for driving quality and speed to market when business success depends on the software applications. Founded in 2007, AppsTech is headquartered in Addison, Texas, with offices in USA, Middle East, and Hyderabad, India. This webinar provides an introduction to image and analytics covering the various image pre-processing techniques used for retrieving information from images. Learn about applying convolutions for noise and dimensionality reduction, and how deep learning networks learn features out of images and perform classifications and regression operations. We shall also cover the different types of commonly occurring noises and their distributions, Caussian, uniform, et cetera, as well as how various filters could be applied to remove noises and improve the quality of the image before feeding to your deep learning networks. Gain an understanding of how different types of edge detectors, including gradient, Lipatian, and canny, and their application over an image for extracting image features. And finally, the session will also be covering a couple of business use cases where computer vision is used extensively for anomaly and defect detection. And now to introduce today's presenter, Grinu. Grinu Sharma has over 20 years of experience in product design, development, and support. He has played leadership roles as global engineering leader, product innovator leader in artificial intelligence, machine learning, solution architect, computer vision and data analytics, process lead, CMMI, Six Sigma, ISO, program agile, as well as people management. His prior experience included working with Fortune 100 companies such as GE, United Technologies, Carrier, delivering customer-centric products and solutions. He has worked closely with C-level executives implementing strategies, product roadmaps, innovation, cybersecurity, and end-to-end -end new product introduction. And now I will hand it over to Grinu. Grinu, the stage is yours. Hey, thank you, Patty, for that quick introduction. <clears throat> Hope I am loud and clear for the audience. Welcome to all the participants for this webinar. As Patty was mentioning in today's session, we will be discussing about computer vision and its related methodologies in designing and deploying a scalable and explainable vision system. In this session, I've tried to prioritize and touch upon some key facts from my experience working with AI and vision, which would be helpful while designing computer vision system solutions. We have it's a, it's a big topic to discuss, but we have only an hour for us to go on. So in that way, I try to make it brief so that we touch upon the key facts. And in case of any any more questions, you can always reach us to our team in future. Okay, moving on. 
Yeah, from an agenda perspective, to, to begin with, uh, we'll be briefing on few of the computer vision applications and the domains where it is used. We'll also discuss on the traditional methods used in vision, and we'll have a comparison with the latest deep learning networks. So what is the difference? We will just try to see that. Uh, we will get into the digital formats and the models used in image analytics because image is the input image decides the quality of your output. So it's better to know how what are the digital formats available and how we should be using that. We shall also discuss on few of the critical properties of images which will be used for model training purposes. These properties are the the the, the properties which will help you in doing the training process of your deep learning networks. Towards the end, we'll also talk about different approaches for designing object detection networks and also briefly go over a couple of business use cases which we have recently worked related to computer vision. Okay, on the computer vision applications. So, so when we say computer vision applications, We'll think that it is a recent things which people are working on, but it's not the fact. It has a history of almost 60 years. So initially it started with, with OCR trying to see that, neurophysiology is trying to see that, okay, how do we map the human vision system with computers? Basically, they started comparing the vision system and try to interpret how women and other animals understand and see. Extensive research has been happening in this field of science which is enabling computer vision to see better and understand the way humans do. Now, in the older days, the, the computing power was a challenge. Now with the advent of technologies and with the availability of labeled data, we'll talk about labeled data in the coming sessions, like ImageNet and all. AI engineers are successful in building models for vision with impressive performance matching human vision. Various industries have already started using computer vision to automate most of their inspection activities to improve the throughput utilizing the power of machines. You can see that you can see computer vision being used extensively in manufacturing, surveillance, healthcare, retail, food industry, education industry, wherever it is possible for automation. Now, what are the type of computer vision application we are really talking about? It could be image classification, it can be a detection, or it can be a tracking in an automotive sector. It can be content based searched rather than depending on metadata. And being such a most demanding technology, it's always evolving. You can see that a lot of research paper being published in computer vision recent days, if you see that triple papers. Providing a solution with a higher performing index is always a challenge. Now, even though we have concepts of reuse and transfer learning, every problem statement needs solution customized to meet the respective performance metrics for the customers. So the reliability of the solution really depends to be proved and with an accepted tolerance for the customer to sell in the market. Now, does that mean that you can just take it a, a image model or an image which is model which is available in, in the market and then use it for your custom purpose? Probably yes, but the accuracy levels will not meet your need. So that's where, uh, we are trying to analyze what are the critical factors which can define and explain and ex and help you in defining the, the performance metrics of a model. What are the small, small factors or key things you, which you should be always, always focusing on while you are de deriving with your uh, computer vision applications. So moving on. Okay, so we we talked about uh, computer vision and the application now i also mentioned that it is not like it is a recent development in the market it has been there since 1960s people have seen come up with uh, ocr development uh, trying to detect uh, edges trying to compare images uh, trying to detect foreign particles in images etc cetera, etc cetera. so how it was being done so what was the method used so traditional image detection depends primarily on image processing to understand the pixel intensities, comparing the images, performs image differences, masking, etc. The primary advantage of this method is that we could deploy the model fast and with less computational resources. Primarily, the model could be also explained well because you know that what you are trying to 
differ or what you are trying to mask in that particular traditional methods. So still there are areas where which, you, which we can use the traditional methods of image analytics for detection. Few examples being if you want to really detect a foreign particle in a particular image. If you want to really uh, measure the dimension of an object or the variation of dimension of an object. If you really want to see a timbre detection. If you really want to analyze the color of a particular object, basically say if you want to just see the color of a fruit and then see that, okay, find whether it is ripen or whether it is raw. So even though we have more control over the design of the system in traditional methods, the system's capability to handle challenge in the image, changes in the images is limited because you can't, uh, it's an unstructured data. It's it's comes from a lot of non-standard environment. So if you are going and depending only on the traditional methods, your accuracy will be really, your scalability of your model will be really questionable. That's where it is very system, it is very sensitive to the changes. The dynamicity was missing and always human intervention was required in the future extracting process with the traditional methods. That's where uh, uh, we have the deep learning models. Now in deep learning models, whatever the uh, the initial processes what we used to do in the traditional methods like pre-processing and feature extraction, that has been transferred as a job to the convolution part of the network. The system has become more capable of handling dynamic changes in the input images and environment. The system learns by itself. The feature vectors are handled by the network there is no such way no but the problem is that it it learns by itself but explaining it become difficult so the deep learning has higher adaptability to changes but the process of design data acquisition training deployment etc are complex compared to the traditional image processing methods now we have discussed about both the methods now is it is the traditional method obsolete now no so probably as a computer vision engineer you can always have how can take the best practices from both the methods and have a hybrid model out of it. So the, the knowledge of image processing techniques will help in designing the deep learning network to enhance the accuracy as well as to increase the confidence of prediction compared to a system where everything is a black box. So that's where we will be focusing on this session much more on how do you streamline your data acquisition? How do you streamline your data pre-processing and feature extraction processes. Okay, so here I'm trying to, sorry. Okay, so here I'm trying to explain the anatomy of computer vision. Probably this will be uh, very much clear to most of the audience, but still it is worth spending time here so that we can see that which area we are primarily going to focus. So image classification starts with normalizing the inputs. This is basically done to standardize the input data so that the noise as well as all as the dimensions are reduced, keeping the critical feature vectors for further optimized processing. Once the pre-processing is complete, the feature extractor kernels are applied. You can see that. Primarily the derivative kernels are applied to enhance the edges. So you you have the pre-processing steps where you normalize your image. When you say a normalization, you can actually make it to standard size, what you really want for your network. You can apply uh, kernels or filters to denoise your uh, system. And then you give it to your feature extractor system where you will your system will try to extract the critical features. So what are the critical features of an image? It could be edges, it could be shapes, it should be it could be intensities it could be gradients or colors present in that image so with that actually we will be able to really predict what is that image containing and if you really try to map it with how humans try to understand the image it is more or less similar to that when we look at an image our eyes will constantly focus on the brighter areas or the contrasting areas to understand what it is. So since we have millions of years of evolution, evolutionary information, knowledge gained as part of uh, our uh, uh, history, we, we are quick enough to process it and then detect it. So that's where uh, uh, in the deep learning network also, we are trying to mimic those operations with the computing power available as of now. Now, once you extract the features, now 
in the classification process we have a train or a learn process where we have a supervised training where we have we make sure that we tell to the computer that okay fine see if you find this type of edges this is what this object is okay now so that's where you do the labeling part once you label and train it the model generate the transfer function which required for making the required prediction for you guys so once the model function is generated primarily when you say model function it will be the weight matrix which will be generated so that on what proportion of what what proportion of this particular x factors the feature extracted the feature vectors have to be put together so that i can or the model can say that okay this is what the the object is so this is where the object is present so that's where uh, the model will learn and then finally classify whether it can be a detection process in an image it can be a localization uh, of an object present in an image finding the x and y coordinates of that image or it can be classification of the image uh, or it can be a defect which is present in the uh, in the image which we which we are interested to detect so this is a high level anatomy of all the computer vision detection process hope we'll uh, Move to the next slide now. Okay. Now, a clear understanding of the right input data is very much important for developing a quality model. And uh, the the input for us is digital images. Okay. So, understanding digital image will make you more prominent, more what you say clarity in what to do with the images how to how to handle the images so that you can feed it the right data to your network so digital images could be broadly classified now as so for our case raster as well as vector images so the bitmap of the raster image is primarily used in computer vision so when you say when you see the bitmap images they are stored in array format like a matrix and where each cell will be representing a pixel the pixel value actually it has a value going from 0 to 255 which will represent the intensity of that particular pixel in that image so we will be we will be discussing more on how that we handled over in the different formats in the upcoming slides now when it comes to vector image it is actually stored in the form of mathematical lines and curve and they are tried to they are widely used in representing fonts or engineering drawings etc so our primarily focus in the discussion for our today's topic will be basically on the bitmap images. Okay, so the bitmap images, you can see that there are many models to represent bitmap images. I am taking only two models here, the RGB and the HSL. There are other models also based on the uh, what type of devices what type of area or domain we are actually using like for the print case we use the cmyk model now with with more primarily for computer vision application uh, with the based on the problem statement what we are dealing with most of the time these two models are used in our discussion we will be primarily focusing on the rgb model so what is that rgb model we all know that it's uh, it's represent the three primary colors the the r for red g for green and b for blue so whenever you're talking about a bitmap image as which is an rgb model we will be representing the image will be represented by three channels each representing the primary colors the image will be a combination of these three channels the representation will be a combination of these three channels okay when you say and i was talking about the pixel so if you take the any portion of that picture each represents a cell of that and each cell will have three values representing the primary colors so if a value is zero it means absolute black and it will be shown as zero and if it is 255 in case of a, a color image it will be white so so that's how it is been arranged so it's it's better to understand that because you are going to the the computer is going to see the the this matrix only it's not going to see the image what how you are seeing uh, the computer is going to see the images numbers and binary numbers so so it's better to understand okay how it looks like and so that you can perform more operations on that basically in hsl model h is representing the hue factor which is the color factor and s represents the saturation how much colorful it is 
nil represents the lightness how much light and dark it is we will not get more much detail into that we will we will talk more about our uh, rgb in the upcoming slides <coughs> okay so now rgb so you can see that when you are trying to process rgb images it's better to understand what are the critical properties of rgb images okay this is not the standard properties these are all properties the standard properties for my my own defined properties because which is which could be discussed in details today okay so basically a few of the standard properties of which map will be the first one can be color you all know that Okay, whenever you are seeing a picture, the color is the first property we get attracted. Okay, so the color property can be used in cases where we solely depend on the color factor and detection process. So if you have a problem statement where you are seeing that, okay, fine, I need to actually use the color for distinction purpose. It is it is the color property which you have to use. Then in that case, you have to use the three channels because color can be only explicitly mentioned when you have all the three primary colors values there. Okay, examples can be if you want to if you want to detect the color of a full fruit if you want to detect the color of a particular liquid it can be water milk etc uh, you can use the color property because in our, in one of our recent program we were just trying to see that how how to detect contaminated water in a bottle so color was the only way we could actually try to uh, use that property to detect that contamination in the water okay so in the RGB case, we have three channels, as I mentioned, to analyze to detect the right color. Which, so that is what we will be focused. That that should be the case when you are dealing with any problem with related to uh, color. This is what you have to really look at. And now the second property will be the resolution. Resolution decides the quality of the image. How many image? How many pixels are used to represent the image? Now, more the pixel, more the finer details you can represent. Now it has. It has an advantage as well as a disadvantage. Can we also have a very higher higher resolution uh, image? Yes, we can always have a higher resolution image, and it will have finer details of the image. Only the problem is to process that image, you may take much resources, computing resources. Now, if you are getting into a stage where you want to detect uh, uh, something in that higher resolution image, you can guess that you need to really see that that format, that, the 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 the, the, the 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 array format, it will be a bigger size, and the 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 number of cells your program has to your model has to process will be more. So you need to also choose the problem based on your business use case what type of resolution you really need you really need a higher resolution or a lower resolution is okay with you guys or not that's also an important deciding fact factor for your uh, for your image computer vision system now brightness and contrast it, it, these are all two properties which are talked always together brightness makes the whole picture now if you want to really distinguish sometimes i even get confused with what is brightness and what is contrast if you really want to increase the brightness what happens is it actually makes the whole picture either darker or brighter so brightness is a property which will actually apply to the whole picture so it's like an offset you have uh, the pixel value across the, for across the uh, picture and then you apply an offset of op, op, offset to that like call say beta and then it the brightness of the uh, picture will get increased and when it comes to contrast contrast is something very important for us in in case of computer vision and object detection contrast represents the difference between the maximum and the minimal pixel values percent it represents actually the sharpness of the image and it really helps with the image edge detections so we will discuss more on edge now so if if you as a human when you are seeing a picture if you see a picture with uh, good sharpness uh, good contrast you'll be able to detect different objects very clearly okay so it is also applicable for computers so when you are trying to do a vision system you need to really see that how you manage the contrast for that now if you see that you cannot actually you also should there is there is also a different opinion where if you increase the contrast too much it can also have a disadvantage if you increase the brightness too much it can also have a disadvantage which we'll discuss in the later slides so another two properties which i have also included as part of uh, um, this is like edges and the noise okay so edges is something very important for us because through edges only a computer 
or even the humans will detect objects present in the image so there are edges is nothing but uh, the sudden change in intensity of pixel values when you can see sudden changes in the intensity values you you can actually predict that there is a presence of edge in that area when you see presence of edge means there is something some objects present there so that is where that's how we take the first step saying that okay fine when you when you analyze an image if you see an edge there okay fine there is a presence of objects there then you will get into the next step okay fine what is object size what is, what is the type of edges it is and then you will get into the detection part now noise is another thing noise cannot be avoided in a, in a picture however way you take the picture you can have noise so simple noise is you take the picture and then you have because of the lightning condition you have a noise on that now noise is also an important property to be analyzed when you are doing the computer vision because unless otherwise you don't uh, smoothen the noise you will not get a better prediction model okay uh, moving on <clears throat> okay so just to quickly say that okay what uh, how um, an image uh, look like in bitmap format you can see that the color property okay now it is represented uh, for the sake of understanding you have put a matrix or put a table you know, over the or the picture you can see that it is somewhat looking like that it is it is it will be more than this but for understanding purpose we have just shown a symbolic representation of the matrix there so for an rgb you will see that you have three channels over there okay representing r uh, g and b and then um, each channel for each pixel there is a value which we discuss later so combining this value will become the uh, value of that particular single cell over there that's how the color is represented now i have already told that when we are doing with the uh, detection processes where you need color this is the format we need to use we have to understand the color and then take decisions based on that now most of the uh, detection system is depending on what actually is present in the system okay so that's where we can actually uh, reduce the dimension of uh, our image by taking only one channel out of it because you 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 lose the color information but you know what is actually or the object information present in that so the best way first will be to they call it as a grayscale okay grayscale is nothing but you take the average of all your three channels and then actually you make the image out of it now here uh, the number of pixels to process by the computer vision model reduces by three because you are not having all these three channels there now that's a grayscale now you can further go down to next level if you know that this again depending on the problem statement or the use case you are trying to deal with if you know that okay fine i am i i am okay with uh, a binary image i know that uh, so you don't want, you want to see that what is a foreground and what is a background in an image okay you want to distinguish between you want to segment that so you can actually take a histogram of that image and see that what are the see the bins and see that what are the uh, mostly recurring uh, threshold boundaries on that and apply the boundaries and make this a binary image so this also helps in some of the some of the cases where you want to deal with image detections okay so we did this talked about the color <clears throat> moving on now we'll start with the uh, noise now okay so we understood the color you understood the format of uh, format of the picture now we we'll, let's see the next property which is called noise which is unavoidable in any photos any images okay noise is random okay and it can happen due to multiple sources it can be due to the sensing devices because the camera what we use it has it might have electronics it might have radiations in that it can impact the image which is being captured it can be due to the lens which has been used it can be due to the light variations of the environment where we are taking the picture it can be due to the reflections of the surface or what which we are taking the image now noise can something be additive or it can be multiplicative but what will happen is like it actually distorts the actual image value of the the pixel value of that particular cell so that is going to impact our detection process in computer vision 
Now you, in the slide, you can see that we have an original image there, and I'm just showing um, a standard Gaussian noise. Okay, we'll discuss on that. Gaussian is something but the normal distribution curve through which we have generated a noise there. You can see that noise there. It will be equally medium distributed uh, white and uh, black patches there. So now I'm just doing that, a combination of that with the original picture, and I'm showing that, okay, fine, how the picture looks like if this type of noise comes into that. So the texture itself have changed, and even um, uh, it become difficult for the detection of edges there, because you see a lot of variation of um, intensities. Now, our system will depend on how to measure the intensities to understand the edges. So it will make your task a little more difficult. So that's how the important role, what noise is plays with your inputs. Moving on. Okay, this is just to, uh, there are, see noise is not predictable. Okay, now you cannot actually see the image and just say that, okay, what is the noise person in the image also? It's not possible, okay? But there are certain standard uh, noises that can happen because of uh, some, some standard issues okay so so i'll say put it like that some standard issues which can happen due to the capturing devices so it could be they call it as gaussian noise can be salt and pepper noise it can be poison distribution noise can be speckle noise etc but overall there are random noise which we cannot predict also because of the lighting variation sent out so but you can see that you have noises of different types and based on your experience dealing with images, slowly, slowly you'll come to know that when you're seeing an image, you will come to know that, okay, what does the, what is the portion of, uh, what what type of noises are present? And you can always design your filters, which is, which will be discussed in the coming session for denoising that part, okay. Now, we have discussed color property. We have discussed edge property. Now we are uh, we have now we have discussed noise property. Now we are also discussing the edge property, and which is very important for object detection. Okay, so as I explained, edges help with detecting the objects, deciding the boundaries, and also when you have when you have a filtered image, when you have an image which is uh, which you reduce the uh, you take only the edges for detection, you have a reduced dimension. So in that way, what will happen is you will be um, only uh, checking all the edges rather than going with the entire uh, system. Now, what are the different type of edges? You can you can see that, okay, fine, you will have a sudden immediate variation and a constant uh, uh, intensity that's called a step variation. And then you have a ramp, a slowly, slowly changing intensity, which is called the ramp. Uh, and then you have spike which comes and goes and we have, we have something called roof, which will, the variation comes in and then it drops down. So these are all something which you can express, which can, we can, which we can see in the images. And then based on detecting the type of edges, slowly you will come to know that what type of filters or how do we, do, how do we apply filters so that you can uh, detect the edges and, and uh, detect the objects on that, okay? <laughs> Now we discussed about uh, we discussed about the edges. We discussed about the noises, and now we are trying to see that how we are planning to filter those things. So now we need to know that okay, fine, we are everything is fine. We have we have seen edges, we have seen noise. Now how do you actually take out these things out of your system? Okay, so that's what we call filters. Okay, we have high pass filters and low pass filters. Okay, so these filters are nothing but, again, uh, you can see that I have shown the filters over there, which is uh, again a, a, a window there with uh, a little bit of uh, number of values there. And then these filters will be applied to the image to make sure that you can uh, remove the noise, you can find the edges. So it helps in noise removal, it helps in feature enhancements, it helps in feature extraction, and also it helps in image obfuscations, the part of the different type of. So when you say low pass signal, actually this particular term high pass and low pass comes from signal DSP, signal digital signal processing, where when you see image each pixel as a signal, and then uh, when you apply a low pass filter there, means it'll, it the low pass filter will actually permit the intensities which are lesser, okay? And it will, it will detect, it will detect and stop the higher intensities. So normally, if you are applying a low pass filter, you are actually blurring. Actually, you are giving a 
um, actually a blurring uh, thing to the uh, uh, image and when you are applying a high pass filter basically you are trying to actually pass the higher intensities higher intensity is nothing but edges so edges are the places where you have higher intensity so you know now you know that okay now whenever you want to do a uh, noise removal you use no pass filter and whenever you want to actually uh, detect the edges you use a high pass filter now in the image i have shown that different uh, some examples of different type of filter first being the gaussian filter where you have the filter values which is applied to the the noisy image and you can see that how the image has become denoised and, and uh, smoothened and then uh, in the next picture i have shown a simple image uh, without noise and then i have given a filter which does nothing because you can see that the filter has a one value in that in the middle in the centroid and rest are all zero but doesn't mean that means that it doesn't consider any of the neighbor in the image it only considers the same it returns the value as is for the pixel so it does not impact the, actually the image there now you have the third filter where i have applied the average of that so you can see that how the averaging smoothing has changed the picture it has blurred the picture okay so it has tried to pass uh, stop all the high high intensity uh, uh, pixel values and try to smoothen it a little and now we'll we'll come to the next slide and see what is the how the how uh, this is done okay so here uh, i'm just showing the difference between low pass and bypass picture which has already been discussed in my uh, previous slide itself so by seeing the filter itself you can understand uh, whether it is a low pass filter or a high pass filter and then uh, uh, the decision is up to the uh, ai engineer or the computer vision engineer to decide which filter to use at what time okay now we talked about filters now a little bit of mathematics to understand how you actually understand the edges in the filters edges how do you understand the edges so edges are uh, and uh, how do you apply filters which can return you the edges in the images so so you know that uh, in uh, uh, normal uh, layman words whenever you have a derivative is a Im image derivative is the term which you will see come across in computer vision so what do you what do you call as derivative is you try to find the rate of change okay so so to understand it better speed is defined as the rate of change of distance when there is a change of distance happening you you the you find the rate of change of distance you get the speed and you find the rate of change of speed you'll get the acceleration so that is the relevant just quickly refreshing your uh, uh, mathematics but we are not getting into the details of that because it's it's a huge subject and we even don't need to do that because this is a simple thing which we need to understand as part of computer vision yeah now applying what does mean what does that mean applying image derivative to your image you're trying to find the difference between pixels okay when you try to different when you try to different try to find the difference between pixels you know that what is the rate of change and that that way indirectly you understand yes there is a difference means there is a pixel difference okay when you say there is a pixel difference that is an indication that there is an edge there okay so there are different type of uh, uh, methods um, we use uh, to actually understand the um, difference it can be backward difference forward difference and center difference most widely we use the matrix back center difference for most of the filters we are planning to use now it's the, it does it, I'll, I'll i'll come to the next slide and it will show that how this has been done okay now to quickly understand say i is a part of portion of your image okay the matrix what i'm showing is i is a portion of the image okay and then the images the filters are uh shown there so there are two filters which i'm showing there one actually both are using a central different you can see that minus one zero one over there and uh, as you know that in your picture you have rows and columns so the picture represents x and y okay so the first filter what you see will actually try to understand the difference in the image in the x direction okay it will scan the image in the x direction and find the difference of that in the x direction and the second filter what i have seen it will scan the image in the y direction and try to find the difference in that now if you see the image if you go over the x direction you can see that first row 10 10 20 20 20 so 
you can see that there is a image intensity variation from 10 to 20 in the first row similarly if you go to the second row and third row you can see that image difference over there now you go to column wise you don't see any difference there 10 10 10 10 first first column second column 10 10 10 10 you don't see any difference okay so that's what we try to mathematically do that using filters you have the filter the red uh, the solid red uh, um, box is a filter you place the filter over there you do matrix multiplication with the filter and you generate the value you can see that the right hand side you generate the value over there now the filter has a square size it's a three by three size filter now if you since it's a three by three size filter you cannot apply it to the the the, the corner uh, pixels so we put it zero over there and we place the filter to the centroid and then do that part and you can see that once the entire scanning which is called scanning and a sliding window this is called sliding window and with a stride of one you move your window one uh, one column at a time and then you get the resultant matrix over there and taking you can see that the resultant matrix shows that yeah there is a difference there is something there in the x direction you has you have edges over the x direction when you go to the y part you see there is no change in the curve so it's an information maybe when you discuss it it can be a smaller piece of information but for a computer it is a big piece of information you know that okay you find find something there so i'm seeing some edges there so that's how it's operated okay okay let's move quickly in the interest of time okay now i've shown how the edges are operating now you uh, you come you will come across uh, when you're dealing with filters you come across two terms called correlation and convolution okay when you are in deep learning you'll hear more about correlation and more about convolution and as a data scientist you'll call uh, hear about more about correlation both are both are actually applying filters or kernels to the uh, image matrix okay the way you are applying the uh, matrix the difference the, the the difference that makes a difference for this correlation actually primarily will help you to understand the similarity part and convolution will help you to actually retrieve the uh, edge information from the uh, image so this will be um, when you are when you are actually taking a filter and then actually doing a correlation and a convolution you will realize that what how it impacts and how it returns a value so when you come to uh, i'll take one particular filter and then i'll do a correlation operation with that and then use the same filter and then try to do a convolution with the x flip and the y flip then you, you you will see the difference in that uh, filter one actually uh, gives you smoothing and one actually gives you edge detection okay uh, moving on now we talked about uh, a high level on how we are uh, the sliding window uh, uh, sliding window uh, uh, edge detection method now that is the basic part okay now you have the image you convert it into grayscale we have seen that what is grayscale and then you apply blurring or denoising uh, filters it can be averaging so you can see the third image it is blurred and then you actually apply the derivative whatever we have seen or discussed x derivative and y derivative and this is how the image looks like in the x part you have seen the differences and that is showing there in the y part you are the differences are shown in the y part and then finally you get the magnitude of both x and y for each fold and then you draw a histogram out of that and apply threshold to it you see the edges over there so now actually you have converted the original picture to the edge edges now you know that it is there are some properties of edges there now if you join these edges you will get closed loops which is called contours and these contours will have properties and then these contours will be used for your classifications purpose because and then you have reduce the dimension of the image you have taken away all the noise from the image you have seen the changes you are only analyzing the changes in the image that means the edges in the image and then you are planning to really detect what is present in the image with your classification algorithm now as i mentioned it has been this is not something which is all of a sudden one day uh, the edge detectors have come up it's it's also followed a series of evolution process the initial edge detectors were previth and sowell so these are all named after the uh, the inventors okay and then uh, you have Meyer and Hildreth and they they have worked on the initial one which uh, Pravit and uh, Sowell has done it and then they have actually made enhanced version of that then the latest one which actually is improvised of, of uh, 
uh, the Laplace and of the MAR and Hilkerts is the canny edge detection. These edge detection algorithms are implemented in most of the uh, uh, open CV packages. You can actually directly use it, but it is always better to understand what actually happens behind the scene so that you will be able to fine tune your hyperparameters in those functions and libraries. Otherwise, you will have to go with the default values. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll be a little bit skipping all these things. We have, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, these two edge detectors are almost similar. Uh, I have shown the uh, the filter there. You can see that uh, they use the uh, sender difference uh, um, uh, filter to first find the gradient of the image, I mean derivative of the image. So derivative will give you the, the edges. Then they use uh, averaging. Uh, basically, it will actually smoothen the image then and then uh, they find the, the magnitude of X and Y and then they use uh, thresholding for that. Once you use the thresholding, you will know that, okay, where are the edges? This is a basic, the first time uh, implemented edge detector. Then you have an improvised version. You can see that the only difference between two is the value little bit changed. Okay, so when you say from move from one to two, you are giving more weightages to the the, the 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 neighboring pixels that's what the uh, sobel detector did that and is it how how this is being happening a lot of researchers a lot of trial and error they will do that and then see that where it's a consistency in performance is happening that's where they decide this filter value so if you want to develop a filter for your custom purpose you really need to understand what you really need trying to achieve and then you really need to really do a lot of trial and error so that you can get a better filter for sustaining uh, your requirements Okay, then uh, the Mar Hildred and again two persons Mar and Hildred both are uh, actually uh, physiologists, human phys uh, uh, doctors who have actually tried to see that how humans are seeing the images, how humans are understanding the edges, and based on that they have come up with this particular edge detector. So they use Gaussian. Gaussian is nothing but the normal resolution, and then the second derivative of uh, Gaussian to understand where are the places. So where are the zero crossing? So zero crossing is nothing but you have a function, you take the first derivative, you give the difference, you take the second derivative, your all constant will go to zero. And then uh, only those in those pixels will remain which have an higher intensities, okay? So you will have better approximation there. So that's where uh, the, uh, they focused on zero crossing and try to uh, apply the threshold to the slope of zero crossing and then actually try to find the edges there. So Canny being the, the best now as of now, they actually also worked on uh, using the Gaussian for smoothing and then they performed the image directive, derivative for finding the edges. And, and, and then uh, with different uh, to the previous method, not only magnitude they have considered, they also considered the direction of that. They have taken the tan inverse of the X and Y coordinates and then find out for each position, uh, the, what is the direction of the particular gradient. So that was also given, given on that. So that's how uh, canny edge detection has started. Okay, so you can use OpenCV for uh, actually uh, understanding canny edge detection. Okay, and um, so I'll be going a little fast because I'm running out of time. Sorry for that. Okay, so now coming back to now we have actually seen uh, the properties of images. Uh, we have seen uh, noise. We have seen edges. We have seen how we are identifying noise, how we are removing noise, how we are detecting edges, how we are removing, uh, understanding the objects there and how we are uh, detecting the contours there. Now. Now let's put it everything in one place here, okay? So now we want to detect an object and, uh, and localize an object. When you say localization, it means the uh, the bounding boxes, what I'm seeing over there, okay? Uh, once you find, finalize an object, okay, fine, there is a presence of object there, and you need to really draw a bounding boxes on that object. So that's where uh, localization stands for. I there are different approaches. These approaches are based on performance. These approaches are based on accuracy. Okay, so now the first approach, the layman's approach I will talk about so that you'll better understand what, if you don't have any other approach, this is the approach I'm going to follow. Okay, you have an input image, you apply histogram of that image. When you say histogram, it's a bar chart. It will actually give you the distribution of pixel intensities. Okay, so basically uh, it will say that, okay, fine. Uh, out of the whole images, this is actually uh, 200 is the, uh, 
um, in density maximum occurring in density so you know that what is the range of pixels values in that and you can apply a threshold to that then you can see that the threshold of the images you will get then you can actually apply all those things which we have discussed now noise you can apply noising denoising things you can apply your edge detections things and then you can just come up with the edges when you get the edges you see and then you draw the contours on that you connect the similar edges okay once you connect the similar edges you will get uh, contours or closed loops and then the, there may be parents closed loop then will child closed loop and so programmatically you can actually identify which the which is a uh, larger closer uh, contours you have to consider now you have the contours and the edges then you have to uh, give feed this as a feature vector to your uh, image detection and uh, algorithms so that it can actually detect the um, uh, object present in the system now so how do we do that okay fine now you have a contour and then you find the centroid of the contour means the center portion of the contour and then you expand then you expand and then actually see that where the intensities are varying uh, into a different compared to the centroid where the intensities are varying till that point you decide on the boundary of that and then draw the boundary there so this is a layman way of explaining that and then you take that particular boundary box and then feed it to your uh, detection and say that okay fine whether it is a human whether it is an animal whether it is an object whatever it is so so that actually will be done by your classification part so if you have if you have control on your uh, all these pre-processing step you will be able to define the proper appropriate um, what you say the outcome of your thing the the, the approach number two actually um, is the latest one where we have uh, uh, you might have heard about yolo and all which are fastest in detecting it does nothing but it uses uh, a grid and anger search window where you use anger to search on all those grids where a lot of in, in, the density of the pixel are more you search over there because they know that presence of objects is more when the density is more and then you de derive the feature map and then give it to for classifying and algorithm so this can be actually there are papers uh, if you can search for grid and anger method you can really get papers to read much onto that okay, these are all two two approaches which i have just mentioned uh, try to relate what we explained in the initial slides and how it is being getting used in the detection side okay now uh, also i want to just make sure that now if you see this network okay this is actually a simple uh, ai network uh, which can be actually uh, now we can explain it now you see that um, uh, with all the understanding we had you see that image and you have multiple layers over that deep learning network and then you mark it as feature extractor you can see that convolution layers pooling layers convolution layers pooling layers these are all nothing but the the pre-processing and the edge detection layers you decide the layer what you want based on the requirement what you need and once the pre-processing is done uh, the edge detections and contouring is done then you have the classification which is a fully connected layer now you can better understand or explain your network from the discussion what we had now and also keras and tensorflow actually allows you to actually get the summary of your uh, ai uh, deep learning network this is actually the right side i can show that what are the different networks what are the input shape what are the output shape how many parameters have been programmed there and even you can actually detect the um, you uh, you even you can detect the uh, output of all these parameters so now what is the uh, what do you, what actually is the need for uh, detecting the output is you can well say that during the verification process you can actually decide okay fine if the output of a particular layer is so and so i'm sure that my 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 detection is going to fail so that's why that's where there are debugging modules available you can use a debugging module to actually debug your network and then actually predict but before all and before all that if you have control on your processing images techniques whatever we have discussed uh, you will be in a better position to explain your network well okay okay so i will be so these are all few of the uh, business use cases which i would like to quickly touch upon and uh, these are a uh, few which uh, we are working in our organization and i've selected based on uh, computer vision uh, application okay the first one actually uh, the road quality monitoring system basically this is a deep learning network as we use uh, transfer learning here we use a parser rcnn network uh, we use uh, uh, that and then you train the model uh, with our own uh, custom images of uh, roads 
it help us to actually uh, it's a hybrid model eventually it can be uh, it, it can run on an edge device as well as it can run on a high-end uh, cloud computing device uh, based on the requirement of the customer and uh, it actually detects support holes uh, it actually detects uh, uh, anomalies on the road it uh, detects uh, anything which is threat to the to the driving moving vehicle okay so that is one thing and then uh, it also uh, 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 detects the driver's uh, gestures, uh, whether the driver is focused on driving or not, whether he's using a mobile phone, doing driving or not, you can take actions, alerts based on this detection. So it's exclusively based on the, the images what we are processing, uh, the frames what we are receiving from the capturing device. With the capturing device what we use here is the uh, dashboard cameras, uh, which is having a front facing and a rear facing camera uh, camera so that we get the front view and the the driver see on that so so that that's that's on the road quality monitoring system we use plenty of see we have plenty of uh, uh, pre-processing filters here because you know that portals if you really want to uh, detect a porthole porthole doesn't have a standard uh, um, uh, size or shape it comes in any way form and even there are more challenges with respect to shadows uh, on the road uh, shadows can be picked up as objects and all those stuff. So, so it was an interesting program uh, which we did for a uh, telecom major in US. And uh, uh, this is uh, some of the challenges we have, which we have faced in this particular uh, computer vision program has been already explained in my previous uh, slides. Now, another thing is on the surface defect detection system where we have exclusively used uh, uh, computer vision for detecting uh, defects on iron roads, water bottles. Um, uh, those are all. Uh, uh, done using again computer vision all those pre-processing techniques and another thing uh, is on the exam monitoring system this has been actually uh, impl implemented for a uh, university where you can actually authorize the uh, student with respect to facial uh, characters and then also you can actually check whether the students are doing any sort of malpractices during the exam uh, in the halls and all and again um, you might have seen face detection system but we have come up with the advanced face detection system where we enhance the images in the picture and then you try to detect that so and when you enhance the picture it can you can see that when you have a uh, video surveillance camera the quality of the picture will be very poor so detecting a person in that will be really challenging so so we use image super resolution that's the next thing use use image to build the picture build the image increase the resolution of that image quality of that image and try our uh, model to actually detect the person in that so that is actually advanced uh, face detection and uh, super resolution part. And also obfuscation is also an important uh, uh, thing which we do. Um, basically we use filters. We already talked about filters and we were talking about the properties of filters. Okay, you can use it for blurring, you can use it for uh, denoising, we can use it for edge detection. And another important property for filter could be you can mask your image okay you can mosaic your image you can mask your image permanently you can mask your image encrypt the image and then you can actually give the decryption key for decrypting the image back into the station so this is these are all there are test cases or use cases where customers say that if I, I want to just send this picture across but i want to make sure that it has been the privacy areas in that images are being masked so that nobody will be able to decipher it so so filters are applied uh, and a very interesting test case use case which you have applied in that part okay so i think it is uh, now coming to the end of the discussion i will actually give uh, 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 the time remaining for any question and answers uh, that was very very insightful and i we do appreciate it greenu a lot of wonderful, wonderful information. We have about two minutes for anyone who has any questions. So please, if you have not asked any questions or need answers to questions, uh, we will send, please do send it to the address I give you at the end of the webinar. Thank you so much. I am ready for the first question, please. Are there any questions?
it appears as if I don't have any questions. However, please note that that is all the time that we have today. And if you do once again have questions that you might think of after, and we haven't had the chance to get to, we will share the answers along with the recording of this webinar. But you may also email us at any time at info at appstechcorp.com. That's info at A-P-P-S-T-E-K-C-O-R-P.com. And we will certainly get back to you as soon as possible. I wanna thank everyone again for joining us for today's webinar and wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Greeno. Thank you.